welcome and I'm grateful to Facebook for uh, letting us use the facility. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad that there are more Facebook people here. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, because because Facebook is you. Okay. Okay. So we have two okay. Facebook people. <laughs> and that's that's great because Facebook is actually sort of uh, at the point of breaking hustle into the industry, right? I mean, we are talking. We are going to study this book. Parallel and concurrent programming in Haskell. But well, first, I'll introduce Haskell, by the way, as soon as we can start reading this and we can precise this from it. We'll, we'll go through this. This is by Simon Marlowe. I think he wrote this book before joining Facebook, but he's now working at Facebook. And uh, he's working on this Haskell project that's within Haskell. Uh, so, it's like the first really big industrial use of. Haskell that we know of, because there's a lot of times right? people using Haskell to you know, uh, sell stocks and buy commodities and stuff like this. So we don't know. Maybe, maybe the Romanian uh, papers will find something about how Haskell is used <laughs> by the financial industry. Okay. So, um, so this is sort of an experimental thing, and um, I'm going to improvise uh, quite a bit, um, and and I also would like to interact so that like we are in it together. And uh, I, I think that probably some people already know a little Haskell. I, I see some people who are from the Haskell user group in Seattle. So, how many people here? Don't know almost anything about Pascal. So, yeah, okay, that, that's good. That's good because we we are going to start with really simple principles, right? Like, like how to design a function, how to multiply the numbers. Um, so, still. Um, so first, let's talk about why. Haskell. Why is Haskell so important? Why is there so much interest in Haskell? Well, not that much. Guess, but <laughs> um, is 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 there a future for Haskell? And, and if, if there is, um, why? I mean, how is how is Haskell better than other languages? If it is, what do you think? All its functional so it's 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 functional. So that's the first thing, right? Functional is better than right? <laughs> <laughs> But well, why? Uh, so so and, and you say it's side effect free. So why is being side effect free such a good thing? Equational reasoning. Equational reasoning is another thing. Yes. Right. So I guess yeah. So so these these two things are probably the most important. So equational reasoning, what, what does it mean? It means that Haskell is one of these few languages that are used in production that actually specify their semantics. It's like most languages like you know C++, how do you specify what a particular program in C++ is doing? Well, you, you go and, and read the, the document, right? The standard document. The standard document is sort of like a more more like um, an expert system training set, <laughs> right? <laughs> there are all these rules, and then there are exceptions to these rules, and uh, these rules cover maybe I don't know eighty percent of code that is written or ninety percent best, right? Otherwise, people do sort of trial and error. See, will, will the compiler actually do the right thing if I write this code? So, but how do you say, you know, how do you define what a language is supposed to do? Right? You have to sort of use another meta language to talk about what a language 
on what a program written in a particular language will do. And this is where, where Haskell actually um, has its roots in math. And uh, you know, I like talking about math, but I'm not going to talk too much about math in this course because it's, it's not really necessary. But it's important to know that actually things are well defined in Haskell. And this is why Haskell is actually a pretty simple language. So there is this myth about Haskell, right? That Haskell is such a hard language to learn and so on. No, as, as languages go, you know, you can probably learn Haskell much faster than, than C++. C++ is really, I used to be a C++ program, so I appreciate the complexity of, of the language. But um, complexity in the language means that Programs are even more complex and harder to reason about. So Haskell provides you this way of reasoning about programs because the meta language for Haskell is math. And math is the instrument that we use for reasoning. Right? So this is called semantics of the language. And most languages have this operational semantic which says, if you do this, then you will get this. The next step will do this, and so on. It's a very imperative thing. It's, it's like writing a little interpreter in the language that says, if this happens, then, then this will be the new state, and then another state, and then we'll say x equals 1, then this, the following things will happen. And that's, that's called operational. So now it tells you the operations that are performed in some kind of abstract machine on which this program is supposed to be run. Right? I mean, in the old times, it was just not an abstract machine, it's an actual machine. You know, if you say this, this will be translated into you know, jump conditional to this label, and then add register EAX to memory location. That's register EBX, and so on, right? Uh, so, so operational semantics is one level above this because it, it kind of abstracts you from this actual machine and says, well, you have some kind of model, some kind of, you know, but it has roots in the Turing machine. The, the Turing understanding of programming is different than the roots of, uh, of Haskell. Haskell is based on Mathematical, more, well, okay, tu Turing is also a mathematician, uh, but um, it's based on lambda calculus. Lambda calculus was invented even long before people um, were thinking about computers. So it's a, it's a formal language, and it, and it uh, was used to actually do mathematics. So being able to reason about a program, that's a very unique thing. There are a few other languages in, in which you can, you can do this. Um, in, which you can, uh, in Haskell, you can reason about a program by translating it into mathematics, into statements in mathematics, into theorems. And there is a, a reasonably simple procedure. It's, it's time-consuming, usually prove something in Haskell, but it's a pretty straightforward procedure how to translate Haskell code, how to prove something about Haskell code. So why is it important? And, uh, I could argue both sides. Is it, is it really important to be able to reason about a program? Why would that be important? Well, okay, we, we, we think we want to like correct. We want to write correct programs, right? I mean, do you like writing correct programs? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> is, that, is that like an assumption that we can take for granted that programmers want to or strive to write correct programs? Do we? Always. <laughs> What about our managers? 
<laughs> and the managers make the decisions, and, 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 and they have uh, in mind um, not this abstract correctness platonic ideal of a program, they have in mind the economics. How much money can, uh, can we sell it already? Are there some bugs that the users would consider unacceptable? Or not? Because in reality, there is a level of bugs that's acceptable, and, uh, and this level is kind of uh, going higher and higher. What, what is the acceptable correct, incorrectness of a program that uh, is being shipped? Oh, it was like with, with the airlines, I don't know, the, the older people here may remember that a long time ago, going on an airplane, taking a flight from Seattle, let's say, to New York, that was uh, quite a pleasant experience. You, know, they were, you were taken care of, you were given good food, and uh, silverware from actual metal. <laughs> glasses that were made of glass and so on. The food was in. It was, and there was much more labor. And of course, people would not have to queue for hours before taking off to go through security. So these were the good times. Uh, now it's kind of different. And and one of the things that happened is that. Uh, the airlines were deregulated, and, and suddenly the people had the freedom to, uh, and, and especially after after the internet, they suddenly had the freedom to pick the cheapest airline. Okay, so people voted with their feet. You know, we want as cheap as possible. You 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 gonna you want to cut my legs to fit me in the in the compartment? Please do that if 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 I can pay ten bucks less. Right, <laughs> and uh, this 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 worked very well, and, and, and you know at some point there, there was a proposal to have airlines where, you, where passengers actually stand instead of sitting, and they have to pay for the bathroom, stuff like this. Horrible stuff. <laughs> um, so the the quality actually of, of air flight is, is going down. Yeah. But there is one thing that probably people would not want to skip money on, and that's like if these airplanes started falling from the sky quite often. So right now it's still you know one of the safest modes of uh, transportation, right? So if they started falling from the sky, then people would say, hmm, okay, let me look at the record of this. Uh, Company and see how many uh, accidents they have. Right? And maybe I'll pay a little bit more, but feel safe. Right? So I think a similar thing is uh, with programming languages, right? Um, like the, the the public is voting by uh, accepting buggier and buggier software, right? And this is especially true about Websites and web programming is, is just horrible, cheap uh, imitation of programming. <laughs> <laughs> but people agree with that. You know, it's, it's, it just doesn't make uh, economical sense to put your best programmers. Um, and use best languages and tools to, to create a website that sells uh, screws or some gadgets. If, if it goes down for a week, nobody will even notice. Right? And sometimes it's really, really annoying, like the, the health plan, <laughs> big rollout, and, and suddenly all these servers are falling. And it's like, well, that's normal in web programming, right? It's, it's not some conspiracy, it's not Obama's fault, or it's, <laughs> this is how web software is written, and it's always been written, okay? 
So expect this. So so but but there is this niche for for Pascal, and that's when actually people start worrying about their lives, right? When planes are start falling from the sky. But maybe it's a good thing to uh, to be more careful about your self-care, right? Um, so so maybe I don't know. One would think, okay, so maybe nuclear reactors should not pass them. But it doesn't seem like people really care that much about the security of nuclear reactors. <laughs> <laughs> they have these mechanical things that can shut them down. Sometimes they fail, okay, so what's the big deal? <laughs> um, but, um, but there are some errors that are extremely important. Like, if you can lose a few million dollars, oh my god, we have to have like the best programmers, best language, and we'll pay them, you know, half a million per year. Now, sadness, Wall Street. So, they do care because there's money involved. Not so much human life, but money is, is that important. Okay? So so there are these industries in which Haskell is actually making inroads. And that's um, one of the examples of financial industries. They have to build models of trading, and uh, the computer says, okay, sell a million shares of Microsoft at this price, you know, and suddenly they lose a lot of money. The stock market crashes. Happens. Okay. Because of that sort. So are there any other uh, areas where, where the quality of software actually matters? Well, it's other matters on Wall Street, so that's just for sure. Banks. Healthcare? Facebook is. Yes? Uh, healthcare. Healthcare. Are they using? Well, maybe not the healthcare, the insurance side of health, but uh, if you have uh, machines running software to do life support or you know, life critical. Thank you, sir. 25. What's that? The Therap 25, it's a famous medical instrument yes. that yeah, accidentally kills exactly. ah, people. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, they should probably try right. but, 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 but ultimately, it's all about the economy. So, if you have bad software that kills a few patients, um, well, maybe it's uh, cheaper to just, uh, you know, uh, give them some money to shut them up, you know, the families, and that's it, yeah, right? Instead of investing in some expensive software. Yeah. Isn't the mo mantra that quality is free, that you write, you have a language where you can express correct software and then you get more production, productivity? You can reuse things without... Yeah, who says that? So I, I would like to see some research on that, that actually producing quality software pays. You spend less time debugging. You know, if you don't have, to, you never have to deal with the null pointer exception. Yeah. Right, right. So, so yeah, there, there's this loss of productivity um, because, well, first of all, it takes much more time to write programs in C++ uh, in Haskell than in C++ or or Java, right? J JavaScript. Um, but on the other hand, you can hire, you know, ten times as many programmers, and they will do this, right? So it's just like uh, dig, uh, digging ditches, right? You just hire more people to dig ditches, and it's better than than build a big, you know, digger. At some point, you have to see the, the economy of, of, of this. It's, uh, so as long as programmers are, are cheap, who cares? Why invest in expensive programmers and expensive tools? 
you can do it on the cheap. Okay, so <coughs> okay, so that's too much philosophy. <laughs> Shut up. You're really selling this course right now. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but of course, there are so many programmers who are just intellectually curious, and, and they they are curious about this functional program, right? And, uh, and it's 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 really mind opening uh, learning this this new way of program. And when people say that it's uh, that uh, learning Haskell is difficult, um, they really don't mean that it's hard to learn Haskell syntax. Although in the beginning it's kind of really really weird, it seems weird, but but you know, I mean, syntax is just, it's just a, um, the simplest part of the language. Um, what is difficult about, about Haskell is that you have to rewire your brain, start thinking different. And it's, it's true that um, the more experienced the programmer is, the harder for him is to learn Haskell. Because we already have certain ways of thinking, you know. So, you know, something repeats, okay, that means uh, I have to write a loop. Okay, and how do I write a loop? Oh, I have to have a counter or a pointer or something, and I have to move this counter. So I have mutation automatically, right? So how can one write programs in a language where you cannot mutate anything? That seems impossible. And then people say stupid things, like, you know, in Haskell you have no mutation, therefore you cannot do anything in Haskell. Anything practical requires mutation. And the universe is filled with mutation. You, know, you take things around you all the time, and so on. I don't know. <laughs> so, so Haskell actually. So let's talk about mutation, right? So that's the fact. There is no mutation in, in Haskell, um, or you don't express mutation in, in, in Haskell in a in such a direct, brutal way like you do in C. Um, but does it mean that nothing changes in, in Haskell? Well, there is there is a way of doing the same exactly thing that mutation does. You can do it in Haskell, and it's not even that hard. Okay. The big difference is that in Haskell, you can tell from the signature of a function whether this function does any mutation whatever mutation means in this context. So you cannot have this hidden mutation, like, like in C++ when you're writing, when you're calling a function, you have no idea whether this function does mutation or not, whether it has side effects or not. Right? Well, there, there are some little ways, like you can declare a pointer const. Right, or something, so that you know that it won't be mutated. In C++, when you define a pointer font, it doesn't mean that the thing it's pointing to cannot be mutated, and so on. So it's a very shallow definition of non-mutability. And, and it's not by default. In Haskell, it's by default that nothing can be mutated by default. And if you want to actually mutate, you have to do something to tell everybody Hello, I'm mutating now. Be careful, right? So that's that's the biggest difference. So so mutation is tightly controlled in Haskell, and it can be expressed in in many different ways that we normally don't think about as mutation. For instance. Um, Haskell uses all these data structures. I mean, how can you have a tree that you cannot use it, right? I mean, how do you insert an element into a tree? Wait a moment, without mutation? Well, so, so there is this whole area of data structures that actually can be modified without mutation. They're called persistent data structures. Okay? This is why in Haskell you use lists all the time instead of uh, using vectors. 
you can use vectors in, in Haskell as well, right? But your default workhorse is a list, whereas the workhorse in C++ is an array or a vector. But, but a list in Haskell has this property that you can easily um, add elements to a list without mutating. These data structures are called, are, are called persistent, not because you can save them on disk. Right? They are called persistent because their previous versions persist. So if you want to add an element to List, right? You don't modify this list. You just create a new list that contains uh, this new element that you are adding and the previous list. And this is very cheap operation. It's all one operation. So I mean, you you would think, okay, if I'm creating a new list, then okay, I have to. It must be, must be O N, right? You have to copy the whole list and add. No, this is all one because of immutability. Because if everything is immutable, then the tail of your list will never change. So internally, what the compiler does is uses a pointer to, to this guy and says, you know, okay, so we have now more guys pointing at this list. Now this is my tail, and some other list says this and this is my tail and so on. So there is a lot of reuse. And, um, but you have to have this guarantee that nobody will modify because if, if you create a new list with, with more elements and somebody suddenly modifies the tail of your list, you will see that. Right? That cannot be required. So a lot of mutability is, is implemented in this funny way as uh, just Constructing a new data structure, completely new data structure, that shares mo most of the stuff with another, with a previous version of the data structure. Yes? I question, so if you add the element to the tail of the list, the end, then you have to make a copy. Right. So so if, you right. If, if you want to add an element to the end of the list, then you have to make a copy. But this is an example in which you should not be using a list. Okay. So uh, it's not guaranteed that a copy has to be used. It's not guaranteed that it's an ordinary in operation. The compiler can look at it and say, here's a clever way of achieving the same thing. What is not guaranteed? That this is a one? So if you add something to the end of a list, well, no. If you add it to the end of the list, then it's a completely different operation. So that's so, that's a different function, which is all right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I think I think the question is: Does the compiler have freedom to say, you know what? I'm not going to implement this. That's only for this. I'm going to implement them as catenable decks, and now we can add things to both ends in order one time. Right. And I think the answer okay. to Haskell is that that no, the compiler is not free. To do that. No, no. Well, so is it free or not? Um, the, 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 the compiler has to follow the semantics. Yeah, that's all. Right. Right. So if can if it can implement the same semantics using a different implementation that is actually faster, then right. it's totally free to do that. Right. Yes. But this would be like super slow to then taking the dependency over the compiler. That's you know by function it has to says append to the front of the list. But the way, can I tell from the syntax, because we are looking at the source code, that it will be all one versus all n? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Well, you know, with every data structure, it's, it's like, you have to study a data structure to see which operations are all one, which are all n, which are all log n, and so on, right? You have to know something about the data structure, right? And usually it's it's uh, documented somewhere. Now of course people try to find better implementations of stuff and at some point they say, hey, I have a queue that's called Bartosz queue and it's all one on both sides and in the middle. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I would love to see that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't call their breath. <laughs> So, so one major thing is these uh, persistent data structures. They they give you the um, they sort of look like they are uh, modifying the data structure, but they are not. They are sort of like a Git repository for the data structure, right? You say I want to add something to it. Okay, check in your change, right? But the previous version also exists. Yes, this is exactly what we're talking about, you have the specification that looks like it's order in or whatever, you have a compiler that's allowed to implement it in any way that that follows the specification. And in fact you can say this is guaranteed to be order one, this is good. so you can say that. But the it's the compiler that is choosing that as an order one operation. It's not intrinsic to the specification. Mm -hmm. Well, but there is a strong pressure on, on anybody who writes a library or writes a compiler, you know, like if they implement uh, prepending to a list, you know, and time, nobody will buy their compiler, you know, so semantically, that's okay, but it's in practice, uh, they will be the, not, the, not in the market anymore. There are many forces acting on the programming language compiler. Not, not all of them are from the point of view of semantics. <coughs> so, there are also some uh, things that are explicitly mutable. There are these mutable references. There's, there, there are data types called IRF, that's a reference to some object that can be mutated. There's MREF. Mutable reference, TREF that's used in uh, concurrent programming. Okay, so they explicitly do this, but uh, but the only way to explicitly do a mutation is when you are inside a monad. And a monad is another thing that like a lot of people just get fits when they hear this this word. Something when, when something is called an object, then nobody protests, right? Like everybody knows what an object is, right? Object is a manager in a company, okay? Right? <laughs> and student is an object, and then you write you know, animal. Student is an animal, therefore, and so so. Yeah, but object is. Now, a known word, so that's good. Monad is a weird word. Where does this come from? I don't understand what a monad is. How many people understand what an object is in an object oriented programming? You do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a monadic thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Only Haskellers understand what an object is. <laughs> and they also say that Haskellers are arrogant. <laughs> so monads are essentially necessary in Haskell, uh, just like they are necessary in every other language. The only difference is that we talk about monads explicitly Whereas in, a, in an imperative language, everything is a monad. All your code is monadic. They just don't know that. Right? So it's like when you discover Haskell, you suddenly say, oh, I've been writing monadic code, code all my life. I did not know that. There's this um, um, play by, by Moliere. When, when the guy suddenly gets a lot of money and becomes such a new for rich, and he has all the money, he can hire people to teach him like how to be polite and how to what the etiquette of eating stuff and, and expressing yourself properly, poetry and stuff like this. And he 
he hires this guy who teach, teaches him how to talk, and he says, well, normally you talk in prose, right? Poetry is not prose. He says, wow, I've been talking prose all my life? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> he calls his wife and says, listen to this, listen to it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, they do monads all the time. They, everything is, is a monad. But in, in Haskell, we don't want to mix all this stuff. We want to really separate monadic code from non-monadic And this brings us to, 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 to another point, that Haskell, um, well, like a lot of languages, like mo most languages, Haskell consists of multiple different languages. If you, if you look at a Haskell program, you will see uh, you know, a mixture of, of different ways of expressing things. You, know? you can see a function that's just like a mathematical function, and then you see something that starts with do, and then lines of code that looks like more like imperative, you know, statements. Um, Haskell, um, there's the language to describe types, and, and type constructors, and stuff like this, and you know, a lot of languages in Haskell use a separate language to define data types. By language, I mean, you know, different kind of syntax, sub-languages sub of Haskell. And the same is true in, in, um, in other languages, like you, know, you program templates in C++, it's like completely different language and syntax and semantics. Right? So, so, so you have this one language, but actually you have multiple different languages. And I, I like to think of this as, um, you know, Haskell is, is a language in which in the beginning you just see the tops of your fingers sticking out of the water. Right? And then when you learn Haskell, you discover, you know, Oh, these things are actually parts of one hand. Okay, there is the core of Haskell, and these things are either uh, libraries that are written in this language, or they are syntactic sugar to to like smooth out the certain complicated uh, things. But this is really one language, and this one language is pretty simple. So what you are learning really is all these syntactic additions that make it easier to program. Whereas in other languages, you actually, you know, you, you start looking down and you see, okay, this is a finger of one hand, right? And, and this other sub-language is just <laughs> another hand sticking out of water and so on. They actually have nothing together. Template metaprogramming in C++ is a different language than regular object-oriented programming and so on. So, so that's what I like about Haskell. It actually has a core uh, that's simple, but, but this is why it's so hard to teach Haskell. Because a lot of people will start teaching Haskell by uh, saying, oh, it's all a function, really. Okay? And now, if we do this and this and this with this function, you know, and add uh, this, then, then we get a monad, or, uh, and, and so on. So, so you start from this unified view, and then go through some really difficult things to explain how, from the simple stuff, build the more complex stuff. And, and uh, it takes very long time for you to actually look at an actual program in Haskell to understand it. Because you only understand the core things, and you don't understand what's the do thing doing here. Do notation is used for monads, right? Um, what are these uh, type um, annotations? What is that? That looks like a completely different language. And so on. So, what what I will do is I will start from these micro languages and just give you a little bit of, of examples of, of each of these languages. So we'll start from the top, and then at some point we'll discover 
um, that they have stuff in common. Or, or maybe even not, but just trust me that they do have stuff in common. And if you want to study this, you, you'll find out. But you don't have to. You can, it's probably easier for a programmer to learn a new language by thinking of it as a multiple system with multiple languages that interact with each other. It's a more engineering approach. Whereas for a mathematician, it would be much easier to say, like, what's the, what are the axioms? Okay? Okay, here are the axioms. Let's derive theorem after theorem. The theorem, and finally, we get some useful results. Programmer wants to have useful results from the beginning. Okay. So the basis of Haskell, the, the what's at the bottom, this common core of Haskell, is that everything in Haskell is pure. Okay? It might not look pure, but it is. So if you see things like, uh, you know, state monad. State monad is something that deals with state. Functions that have access to state, and they actually modify the state, read from state, write in state. That looks like mutation. That looks like side effects, right? That's definitely side effects. Changing the state of the program is side effect. <coughs> Or printing something, writing to a file, that's a side effect, right? If you have pure functions, you can't do that. A pure function cannot write to the screen or accept user input. So that would be side effect, it would be something that is not repeatable. Um, <coughs> So when you are learning Haskell from this other perspective, you say, well, okay, so there are things that do mutation, okay? And there are things that are impure, they have side effects, and so on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay? And, and it's fine, okay? You'll be able to do your mutation. You'll be able to do your input-output, and here's how you do it, right? But at the bottom of this is, this is all expressed in using pure functions. Purity is everywhere in Haskell. How, how clever is Haskell to actually express all this stuff that imperative programmers do using pure functions? And that's, that's something that requires really a little bit deeper understanding. And this is something that requires you understanding more. <coughs> So purity is extremely important. So, okay, everybody knows what pure functions are? Okay. So, I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> I see everybody's nodding. <laughs> so a pure function is a function that's like a mathematical function. It's, it's, it's just a mapping from input to output. So if you give me x, I'll give you the value. Respond. If you call me twice, I'll give you the same value. Right? It's re repeatable. It's every time you call a function with the same value, it will give you the same result. Right? So that's one part. And so it, it, what it what it means. In simple terms, is a function has no state. It doesn't remember that you already called me. No, every time it's a blank slate, <coughs> and every time I'm calculating a mathematical function, and mathematical function has only one result from one argument, and not change its mind. So, for instance, the function get char is that a pure function? takes input from the user, right? No, it's not a pure function. It will return a different character every time. So it's not a pure function. So you see the problem, right? Um, and the other thing is, it's not supposed to have any side effects. 
you call a function to calculate the square root of uh, some number, it should not dispense food for your cat. That would be a side effect. And also, doing, doing output is a side effect, right? I mean, if something appears on the screen, you know, you're calling some function and something appears on the screen, that's a side effect. So IO is, is pure side effect. And yet we can do it in house. Okay, so, so, you know, people start in, in, in other languages with, with hello world program, right? write hello world to the screen. You can't really do it in Haskell at the basic level because you have to use the IO now. So you have to start from pure functions and then explain how moments work. I could do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna show you how to write a program that uh, prints hello world. This is how you do it. It's a, it's a sort of a DSL, little sub language of uh, Haskell that does input out. That's it. And later you learn how it, how cleverly it does. It. So why is it so important that every function is pure? Well, there are two reasons. Maybe there are more. Uh, but, but I can off the top of my head, I remember two reasons. Right? One reason is that pure functions uh, let us do this <coughs> reasoning about programs. Because if, if a pure function, you know, if a pure function calls another pure function, you actually can take this function that it's calling and inline it. Call it twice, you inline it twice. Call it ten times, you inline it ten times. The whole execution of a, of a Haskell program can be understood in terms of inlining stuff. Now, I'll show you little examples of this later, but this is called equational reasoning. That you can actually say a function uh, declares two things to be equal. And you can substitute one thing for another, either way. Right? And this is the power of, of, of reasoning in Haskell. This is what lets us write uh, correct software if we put enough effort in. Right? I'm not saying it's easy to write correct software in general, it's, it's not. Right? But in other languages, even if you wanted to write correct software, uh, you will have to either uh, like restrict yourself to a tiny subset of your language. Like Java, for instance, has this, uh, what's it, tiny Java? That's a subset of Java that actually is provable. Kind of like Java. What's it? Kind of like Java. Featherweight, yes, featherweight Java. Right. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language in which you can actually prove correctness of the stuff, but it's featherweight. It has a, it's a very tiny, tiny subset. Haskell is totally proven. <clears throat> but the second reason, and this is why this book, the second reason is if you have no mutation, no side effects, if all your functions are pure, then you can run them in parallel. And you will never have these low-level data races that are so pesky. Data races. This is what kills parallel and concurrent programming in every other language. And I've done this for many years in, in, in C++, and I worked for this company in forensic that, that made a very interesting uh, concurrent debugger. So I've seen it firsthand how hard it is to write concurrent, co correct concurrent programs and how impossible it is to find the, the bugs other than by releasing your software and waiting for bug reports from the users. And even then, you know, you get a bug report from the user. It's irreproducible. 
because every time you run your program, you have a different interleaving of, of your threads. So you might wait, uh, you know, a thousand years to reproduce the same interleaving. Now, in Haskell, you don't have data races at all, by definition, because everything is a pure function. <coughs> So this is why I want to talk about this book. To show you that it is actually possible to write parallel and concurrent programs. It's possible, okay? Despite your all experience if you are programming in other languages. Probably at some point you said, then no, this is impossible. <coughs> I give up. In Haskell, you can actually do this. This is like, for me, this is the biggest advantage of using Haskell. You can actually write the correct programs. <coughs> um, let's do a break, okay? And then we'll maybe see some code. <laughs> I know you were a little bit.